Isn't it amazing? I don't know. Sometimes maybe our life can be pretty amazing. But it's interesting that we can still find things to complain about. Or, or get negative or fearful and just, 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 just get out of faith. And man, it's, it's amazing. But I think we do live in a pretty negative culture. You know, and if you find yourself looking at Instagram reels or, you know, uh, YouTube and you see all the, the, the things that are supposedly happening and coming and everything is contaminated and no matter what you do, it's going to kill you. And, you know, it's like it's easy to kind of get down sometime. But I want to let you know that none of the negativity in the world can compare to the power that is in Jesus Christ and the spirit of faith. So I came today to build your Faith, because we overcome by faith, and we're gonna we're gonna get into a higher state of mind. We've talked about that last week. We can get into a low state of mind. The goal is to be in a high state of mind. Low state of mind means there's clutter. I've got a lot of things coming at me. I'm trying to multitask, think about a lot of things at once, I'm trying to figure out which problem to worry about most, and maybe it leads us to anxiety and fear and and depression and disconnection and discouragement and all these things. Put us in a low state of mind, and we want to escape. We may even find ourselves hating our life. If we're not careful, we'll begin to hate ourselves. So I wanted to encourage you today. The title of my message is, is this. Don't hate, elevate. Come on, give somebody a high five and say don't hate. Come on, tell them don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. I just got to elevate. Elevate what? Elevate your state of mind. You know, Billy Joel said in a song, he had a New York state of mind. Well, I'm not, talk, not talking about a New York state of mind. I'm not talking about catching a greyhound down the Hudson River line. I'm talking about having a kingdom state of mind. And if you can elevate your thinking, the Holy Spirit can elevate your life. See, the life that we have is often a reflection of the thoughts that we think. Thinking is so very powerful, and, and what comes into your mind many times comes out of your life. And it really is impossible to have a positive life of faith with a negative mindset. So there is a battle. There, there, there are negative thoughts that come at us. In fact, there's another syndrome that I recently, a few years ago, found out about. Another syndrome. Can you guys imagine that? Another syndrome. It's called ANTS, A-N-T-S. It means automatic negative thought syndrome. You're like, I've got that. I've got that. <laughs> and basically, these brain scientists and doctors have found that these, these negative thoughts just fire out of nowhere. Isn't that amazing? These negative thoughts are coming at us. And, and when we think about the mind, the mind really is a battlefield. So we could say that life is either won or lost in our mind. Because we're in a battle, and if you don't think you're in a battle, you're probably losing. But the scriptures tell us that we are in a battle. I want to go to the word in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. I'm going to read this, and then I'll kind of unpack it. It says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons to knock down, uh, wor not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Everybody say false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Christ meaning the word of God. Jesus is the word. So there when it says to obey Christ, it literally means to obey the word of God. And so we see that there's this, this way of thinking, and the Bible refers to it as a stronghold. A stronghold of human reasoning. And if we're honest, we've all got our reasons and we have reasons, right? We got reasons, and we reason sometimes, and reason sometimes can keep us from obeying and believing the word of God. And it said false arguments. What is a stronghold? Well, if I could just break it down into a simple form, a stronghold is a house of thoughts. It's a way of thinking. Now, the, the, the term was referred to in battle days when there were castles and fortified walls. It was this place in the city or, or in the arsenal where, as a last line of offense, these, these, these defending uh, cities could go into this stronghold. And it was very difficult for the enemy to get them out of the stronghold because they would kind of hunker down in the stronghold. Well, the scripture says that we have strongholds in our thinking 
And the enemy uses false arguments and lies to get up into these places, set up lies where we believe the lie is a true. It's a false argument. And, and, and God says we have mighty power to demolish these strongholds. So as I was praying for you last night, I felt in my spirit that there were some of us here that have, for whatever reason, whether it was through trauma, whether it was a mistake, whether it was some accident, that, that the enemy has come in and built up a stronghold in your thinking. It is a false argument that you have believed is a lie, and it is the source and the loss of your joy and your hope and your faith. And I declare today, the word of God is going to demolish those strongholds, and you're going to get your joy back. You're going to get your faith back. You're going to get your hope back, because ain't nobody mad but the devil. Don't hate elevate. Why is this important that we get victory over these negative thoughts? Because not only spiritually, but physically. Again, clinically, it's proven that chronic stress begins to age your brain. It, it, it stops the flow of the feel-good chemicals. Um, it also keeps your brain from producing new cells. And, and you can just see all of these negative effects that, that stress has on the body. It shrinks the brain. But the thing about the brain, from what I understand, and I'm not an expert, but there are neural pathways, and your brain has plasticity. I, I feel really intelligent when I say neural plasticity. I didn't stumble it's neuroplasticity, that's right. <laughs> but it just means that your brain has a, a pliability to it. In other words, your brain, when you think something new, uh, a, a neural pathway can begin to be uh, created. And if you think it long enough and often enough, that neural pathway becomes stronger. It's almost like when you put fertilizer on, on, on grass and it grows more, or a tree. It's the same way. The more I think it, the stronger it gets. But watch this. If I stop thinking about something, the more I do it, the brain has something called neural pruning. And it'll begin to shrink and eventually break off. And I, and I need to let you know, this, this proves that the word of God and science go together. And by the way, when, when the enemy kind of comes to people and uses this false argument of, do you believe in God? No, I believe in science. Again, that's a false argument. The enemy has come up and this person really believes they believe science and not God. But if they knew the truth, they would know that science means knowledge and God is omniscient, which means God is all science. So if it's knowledge, it's God. Again, that's a, that's a stronghold. But we see that, that, that the Bible matches up in Romans chapter 12, says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, renewal. We got to renew our mind. We've got stinking thinking. Like, I think we're born stinking thinking. But we've got to renew our minds so that we can prove God's perfect, acceptable, and good will. If you want to know what God's will is, renew your mind. How do I do that? By creating new pathways according to God's word. It's a way of thinking. And the more that you think that thought, the stronger it gets. Here's something else I'm learning about the brain. Is that when you do hard things, your brain will cooperate with you. And the more you do it, the easier it will become. When you do easy things, your brain will cooperate with you and the easier it becomes. That's why when you cheat on that diet, you make that compromise. Isn't it amazing? Just a little cheat day or two. Hey, it's a cheat week, baby. Come on. <laughs> That's why I try not to cross that line because I know if I make that little compromise, that little nerve is going to say, come on, feed me. And, and if, you, if you go along with that, it gets stronger. And I could use that in so many different ways. Now, doesn't that kind of make sense? That's why I'm going to choose to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow God's way. And, and I'm going to create this neural pathway. So when you do hard things, your brain cooperates with you. Recently, I have been trying to grow in my health. I just turned 54. So I'm trying to do things that are going to foster longevity. Because, thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Because um, I want to do this for a while. And I want to be healthy for my grandkids. And so I started studying and looking at cold plunges. You, have you seen this craze, like the cold plunge deal? And so before I invest in anything, I like to kind of do beta tests. 
because I don't want to get at me like, I can't do this. I can't do it. So I started taking cold showers. I'm talking ice cold. Now, if you knew me, I like a hot shower. Come on, anybody, it's like a hot, not just hot, like hot. Like I get out of the shower red. Like, oh man, just give me that. I don't want to get out. I just want to stay right here. So I decided I was going to start doing the cold shower because it's got benefits for your skin, uh, for sleeping, for breathing, uh, for muscle recovery. All the, I mean, you, you could read about it. So I decided to turn on that shower, and I'm getting in. I'm taking. I'm doing new things. I don't have the neural pathway yet, and so I'm like, Whew, I can feel the coldness. I'm already wanting to get out. So I stick my toe in there, Whew. and finally I got my ankle in there. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And finally, I'm like, oh, I can't play with this. I, I step into it. And I mean immediately. <sighs> and I found out that doing that is really good for your cardiovascular system and your lungs. Who knew? But I start yelling. And I'm not going to yell like I yelled because I have a microphone and it would hurt your ears. And my son came back and said, Dad, you okay? I thought you fell. I'm like, no, just taking a cold shower. Ah! But now, I've been doing this for three or four months, and now it's not as hard, and I can get into it for two or three minutes. And, and, and again, my point is showing you this, is that when you do hard things, your brain will cooperate with you. So stop saying, that's too hard. Because everything in life is hard, you gotta choose your hard. You've heard me say it. Having a good marriage is hard, but divorce is hard. Being healthy is hard, being unhealthy is hard. Being blessed is hard, being not blessed is hard. Following Jesus is hard. Not following Jesus is hard. Having wealth is hard. Not... Are you with me? So choose your hard. That's why we're going to renew our minds. So I want to give you some things today to put into your arsenal because you're going to win the battle in your mind. I want to give you four things today that I think can help you. I want to equip you. These are things that I'm living out, putting into practice. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. The first thing we're going to do is this. We're going to learn how to feed the positive. Feed the positive. What does that mean? means I'm going to look for the positive things. Because I have a, some, I, I used to think that my spiritual gift was finding things wrong. I found out that wasn't a spiritual gift. Because I can walk into a room and see everything wrong. In fact, I was in worship and I saw a board that was disconnected from the stage. Like I'm trying to focus on Jesus. All I can see is a board that needs to get fixed. And so I've got to look for the good. And I've got to feed the positive. Because not only is that true out here, it can be true in here. And sometimes I can be my worst critic, and I can beat myself up pretty good. So I've got to learn how to feed the positive. It's kind of like that granddad trying to explain to his son or his grandson. He said, inside of you, there's, a, there's two dogs. There's one that wants to do right and one that wants to do wrong. And the child says, which one wins? He said, the one you feed the most. So you have a positive dog in you and a negative dog, and whichever one you feed the most is going to be the one that prevails, so we're going to learn to follow the word of God. You see, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have failures. How many of you would be honest enough to say you've made a mistake? You've had some failures? Yeah, me too. I've had failures as, a, as a, an individual. I've made mistakes as a husband. I've made mistakes as a father. I've made mistakes as a pastor. But see, I can't allow those mistakes to get into the negative side of life because then I'll begin to define myself based off my performance. And when I perform well, then I'm good, but if I make a mistake, then I'm not good. That's why I've gotta be careful that when I have success that I give the glory to God. See, every blessing's gotta turn into praise or it'll turn into pride. And, and so I've gotta make sure that, that I'm not defining myself based off of my mistakes because here's why. Failure is not a person. It's an event. You're not a failure until you quit trying. In fact, a winner is somebody that failed and just got up one more time. Come on, if you failed and you're down today, would you just get up because God's not done with you yet and you're gonna win this thing. I believe it in Jesus' name. So we've gotta feed the positive. You see, it's not about what other people say because people might throw your failures up in your face and that's okay. Don't hate. Just elevate, just elevate. See, who I know I am is more important than who they think I am. 
It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what I know and believe in what God says about me. And here's what I know. God says I'm chosen. God says I'm blessed. God says that I'm loved. God says I'm redeemed. God says that I am gifted, that I am anointed and appointed. God says you are anointed. You are appointed. You are chosen. You are blessed. You are loved. You are gifted. And you've got to believe that God is for you. Who in the world can be against you? So what are you going to do? You're going to feed the positive. Here's the second thing you're going to do. We're going to tune in to trust. Tune in to trust. I'm going to talk next week more about how your brain is an antenna. But today, I'm going to talk about tuning in to trust. Tune in. We used to say that back in the day, before internet and streaming. We'd be like, tune in. What does that mean? It means I'm going to tune in. I've got to tune in to trust. Why? Because doubt comes at me all the time. And can I just be honest with you? I'm a little transparent. I have doubts kind of a lot. And when you read the scriptures, I think it's interesting that even the great apostles had doubts and Jesus was right there with them. In fact, when he was resurrected and he was about to ascend in Matthew 28, it says that they worshiped, but some doubted. Isn't that amazing? They could see the resurrected savior. So doubt doesn't make me bad, but it does make it real. So what am I gonna do? I'm learning to stop and pray a little prayer. You know, you're one thought away from reconnecting to trust by just simply praying this prayer and remembering what Proverbs 3, 5 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will what? Show you which path to take. So I'm gonna pause. Instead of giving in to worry and fear, I'm gonna remind myself that I am loved. Why? Because love drives out fear. And, and I'm going to tune in to trust because I'm taking some steps of faith. And when I take steps of faith, making good choices, sometimes I don't see instant results. And I know that we love the scratch off results. But in this development and formation of your character and calling is not going to happen in a day. It's going to happen. Transformation happens over time. You are saved in a moment, but transformation happens over a lifetime. It is a journey of faith, and that's why at Turning Point, we want to help you move forward in your journey. You may have thought you were stuck. You're not stuck. You just quit moving, and God wants you to get up and keep moving because there's more for you, but it's not going to be easy. Jesus didn't say the, the path to life is easy. He said it's hard. So we're gonna, we're gonna do hard things because it prepares me to do great things. I mean, think about this. When you start a new habit, I, I found this, I thought it was interesting. It might take 30 days to create a new habit that could change the next 30 years of your life. You could, you, 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 it could take one hour of workout to give you momentum and dopamine for the rest of your day. 30 minutes to complete your morning routine could literally give you momentum the rest of the day. Five hours reading a book, one instruction could take your life to the next level of blessing and purpose. Learning a new skill in the next three months could literally add tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to your income. Is anybody interested in that? See, so I've got to be willing to do new things. And then when I'm doing that new thing, I've got to tune in to trust. Why? Because the Harvard School of Business said that the law of success is this. In the middle of success, it feels like failure. That's why when you can't trust what you see, you've got to trust what he said. God, I'm taking this step. I'm honoring you in my finances, and then my washing machine gets broken. But, Lord, I'm going to trust you because you said when I honor you, you're going to open up the windows of heaven. So I'm going to continue to honor you. I'm going to continue to walk in faith. I'm going to continue to forgive, even if I say I forgive you and they spit on me. Like, I'm going to continue to trust. Why? Because if I trust you, I know that you're going to direct my path. I'm going to tune into trust. I'm going to do hard things. Why? Because success doesn't happen in a day. It happens daily. Now, I know you guys have been eyeballing this. <laughs> Who can tell me what this is? It is a pickle. You could say that it was a cucumber that's been submerged in vinegar. So think about the process of a pickle. You don't just put a cucumber in there one time. Oh, look, it's a pickle. 
No, it's got to submerge down into that vinegar over time, and eventually transformation will happen. See, you, you've got to get immersed in the things of God. You've got to get immersed in the Word of God. You've got to get immersed in prayer and worship and honoring and serving, and over time, you're going to see transformation. You've got to tune into trust. That's why somebody here needs this scripture today, and it's Galatians 6, 9. Don't get tired of doing what is good, because it's just the right time. Come on, everybody say the right time. You're gonna have a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. I wanna tell somebody today, you've been doing the right thing and it feels like all hell is broke loose. Hey, that's a good indication you're headed in the right direction. You need to be concerned when hell is not coming against you. Anything that makes a difference will be resisted, but if you submit to God, the enemy will run from you. So tune into trust and don't give up. There's a due season coming for you. Not only am I gonna feed the positive and tune into trust, here's the next thing I'm gonna do, is I'm going to speak truth to lies. One study I was reading said that there are nearly 50,000 thoughts that we have every single day. 50,000. 75% of those are negative thoughts. And then they say that 75 to 80% of those thoughts are on a loop. (laughs) And when you think about that negative cycle, that wants to get you stuck and pull you in. And you hear those thoughts. You gotta, you gotta understand this. The thoughts that you hear in your head all sound like you. Now, I hate to ask, but hopefully you're not hearing multiple different voices in your head. <laughs> That's a whole nother message. <laughs> but see, here's what I know. Is that when God talks to me, and I feel like it's God, it sounds like me. I just have to follow it. How do you know that? Because it's based in the word. See, it lines up with the word. Watch this. If the enemy is lying to me, it sounds like me. Wouldn't it be great if you heard, go ahead and do it, Michael. (laughs) Shut up, devil. Or if you heard Morgan Freeman's voice, This is the Lord. Like, no, no. See, that's why we've got to learn how to hear the voice of God and recognize it and discern the voice of the enemy. How do we do that? By knowing the word of God. See, the word of God is the true and the authentic. That's why when you hear the the, the counterfeit, you'll know the counterfeit because you know the real. You do understand that when they're training agents to recognize counterfeit bills, they don't show them counterfeit ones. They study the authentic so that when a counterfeit crosses their path, they can pick it out immediately. And that's why we've got to know the truth of God's word so that when the lie and the counterfeit thought comes into your head, you can know that that is not from God. It is a lie from the enemy. So watch this. All the thoughts are coming from somewhere. And the lies are not coming from you. You would never talk to you that way, would you? God would never talk to you that way. So what are we going to do? See, the enemy attacks your your mind and my mind with thoughts. And we're not going to overcome the enemy by just thinking better thoughts. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to follow the pattern of Jesus. Ephesians 6, 17 says to take up the helmet of salvation and the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. So we overcome the thoughts and the lies of the enemy in our minds with words from our mouth. See, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, Jesus used the word of God. Why? Because it's a sword, and it's time for you to pick up that sword and break off the devil a piece of the word of God. Why? Because he is a liar, and he cannot stand against the word. So we're gonna overcome with the word. That's why you gotta be in the word, church. Not just to be a good Christian, but so that you can be armed, so that you can know how to overcome That's why we have an app, and in the app, I want you to download our app. Our team has worked hard to put resources there. You click on the resource tab, and it says daily Bible reading plan. It takes you to a a soap devotional journal plan. It gives you a worship playlist, a prayer guide. Like, we've put everything there for you. We put it there for you. We can't do it for you. And by the way, God won't do it for you either. Only you can do that. But when you do that, God will do what he can do. And when you do what he can do, you'll see what he can do. So take the step 
and tune into trust, meaning I've got to speak truth to myself. When I hear that I'm insecure, I've got to say, no, that I'm chosen, I'm blessed, I belong here. If I walk into a room of world-class leaders and they all have ministries larger than mine, I can't think, what am I doing here? I've gotta think, God, you must really think a lot of me by putting me in this room right now. There must be something you're about to shift in my life. God, thank you. So you gotta speak truth to yourself. And that's why your homework this week is to write down some I am statements. At least five. What are five things that you want to grow in to be more like Christ? Five things. Maybe more. You're like, Pastor, I need 10. Go for it. Jesus had I am statements. So do I. Here's a few of mine. I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God. I am the apple of God's eye. I'm God's masterpiece created to do good things, and I can do all things. Now, here's some specifics. I am generous. I'm creative. I'm innovative. I am courageous. I am loving. I'm empowering. I'm a vision-driven leader, and I am disciplined. And recently, Pastor Charla asked me to add one. She said, would you add, I am kind all the time. <laughs> I laughed so hard at that. That was so good. I thought that was funny. But you need to write your own I am statements. So you need to speak truth to lies. Here's the last thing. We're going to appreciate to elevate. Appreciate. Think about the word. Now, over the last 20-something years, uh, Pastor Charlotte and I have bought homes, fixed them up, sold them, and every time we did that, our house would appreciate. And what does that mean? It appreciates. What does that mean? In other words, we bought it for this price and sold it for this price. Appreciate means to what? Elevate. So when you appreciate, it causes you to elevate. That's why God said in Psalm 104, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise and give thanks to him. Why? Because we enter our day with gratitude, it automatically elevates us. Let me give you some more science. Did you know it's impossible to be stressed and thankful at the same time? Try it. Put it to the test. The next time you're sitting in traffic on 75, and I'm preaching to myself, my wife's keeping me accountable, she's going to remind me, trust me. Start thanking God that you have a car. Because some people don't even have a car. Start thanking God that you have gas to put in the car. Thank God that you have a place to go because there's people that have no place to go. And what are you saying? I'm saying that when we appreciate, it elevates us. Gratitude. See, when gratitude flows out of our life, abundance flows into our life. And there is nothing that will cut off the flow of faith quicker than entitlement, victimization, and complaining. That's why the scripture says, do all things without complaining. In fact, you know what kept the children of Israel in the desert? Complaining. It was time to take a step of faith and enter into the promised land. They would complain and God would say, take a lap. Take a lap. I don't know about you, but I don't want God saying, take a lap. I've circled some places and I have learned that when you complain, you remain. But if I can be grateful, it will cause me to rise up out of anything that I may be in grateful and, and you say well pastor what if negative things are happening sometimes you have to reframe it in fact in counseling you'll find when you think back on a story they'll ask you to why don't you reframe that why don't you th think about remembering it a different way again it's all about the thought process it's kind of like the girl who came home from college and she said to her parents she said mom and dad I got a really really hard conversation I need to have with you. I said, okay, honey, what? go ahead. I said, well, I was at this bar. I know I shouldn't have been. And this cute guy was there. I hate to say it, but we ended up hooking up and I'm pregnant. And he's in rehab. And he gets out in 13 months. And when he gets out, he's gonna start looking for a job. We've thought about getting married and getting a house, but we can't afford any place. So instead, he's going to be moving in with us, and I'm quitting college. Her parents were like, <laughs> what? And she said, actually, none of that's true. 
I got a D on my chemistry exam. I just wanted you to see it could be really worse. <laughs> oh, a D is okay. You got to reframe it. That's hilarious. My kids are going to try to use that on me too. I just, I just gave some students some ammunition right there, boy. Y'all can cash at me at dollar sign P. Michael Turner. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I was remembering back to uh, 2019, I believe it was. It was our 19th, or maybe it was 2021. I think it was 2021. And it was like our 19th anniversary. And my, my son, Presley, had gotten his license. And so we agreed on some things. When you get this done, then, then we'll get your license. And I hope you get a car. And I, I worked really hard. I found this 2004 Altima, 70,000 miles. I'm like, woo, woo. For 5K, I'm like, that's it. Bam. Like, don't you love it when you find a good deal? Like, it's like ah, I just feel so good. I got a good deal. Well, on this night, he left our home with a friend and we're about to go to bed. It's about 11.30. Get a phone call. He says, Dad, I just had a wreck. I need you to come get me. I said, you okay? He goes, yeah, but the car's totaled. And my first thought, if I'm honest, now that I know he was okay, was I can't believe. And all I had was liability insurance. The one time I didn't get full coverage. Like, I could go down that path. And I mean, I probably got myself in a headlock. Like, just beating myself up. Looking at the negative. 5,000. Gone. But as I arrived on the scene and I saw the car bent in half, they had been T-boned. I began to change my focus. And I began to thank God that my son wasn't injured or dead. I had to thank God that no one was injured or dead. And see, sometimes, even as bad as it may seem, we've got to thank God for what didn't happen. See, sometimes it's not about what he did do for me. Sometimes it's about what he kept me from. Sometimes it's about that I didn't die in the car wreck. Sometimes it's about I didn't die in the overdose. Sometimes it's about I didn't go to jail and, and the marriage wasn't lost and my kids didn't lose their minds. Sometimes I didn't die of the disease and, and I didn't go into recovery. It, sometimes I've got to find a reason to give thanks in all circumstances. You see, I've got to learn how to thank God through the pain, through the disappointment, through the tears, through the discouragement. I, I don't know why it happened. I don't know what's going to happen, but this one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to lift my hands, and I'm going to praise Him, and I'm going to thank Him, and I'm going to worship Him. Is there anybody here today who can say, God, I thank you for what didn't happen. I thank you for your goodness and your favor and your faithfulness. I dare you to throw both your hands up right now and say, thank you, Lord. Oh, elevate, elevate. Come on, high five three people and tell them elevate, elevate. Ah, you can remain standing with me. Remain standing, remain standing. I'm done, I'm done. I told you, you're leaving this place different today. Why don't you bow your head right with me? Right, right, right here, right here. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus that every stronghold is demolished. Every lie is exposed. No longer will we believe the lie. Our thoughts are held captive according to your word of promise and truth. And I declare blessing and life and faith and joy and love and all the things that the enemy may have stolen from every person here. We declare it. We claim it right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, if that's you, say, I receive it. We're going to leave different, God. We're going to... We're going to feed the positive, tune into trust. We're going to speak truth to the lies. We're going to appreciate and live a life of gratitude. Not only so that we can live at a higher state of mind, but so that we can be a witness for Jesus when we're going through the storm. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you feel like your life is lower than it's ever been. Can I give you some hope. Sometimes it's at the lowest place of our life that we're willing to look to God. 
Let that need drive you to God and God will meet your deepest need. Just turn to Jesus. Surrender your life. Call on the name of the Lord. Some of you need to recommit your life today. You've been straggling. You've been wondering. You're not serving the Lord. You've been discouraged. Maybe you thought God gave up on you. Listen, he's not done with you. Just say yes. Follow him. Deny yourself, and that's where you're going to find life. Be consistent. Don't give up. The best is yet to come. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, you say, I want heaven, and I want Jesus. I want you to lift your hand on the count of three. You ready? One, two, three. Three, come on, hands up, hands up. Yeah, hands are going up. Thank you, God. Every hand, yeah, hands up, hands up all over the building. Yeah, all the way to the front, to the back. Oh, left to right, God, thank you. Right now online, God's talking to you. Come on, put your hand in the chat. Just say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. And in this holy moment, could we all just say this together by faith? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for dying for me while I was still sinning. I believe you're the son of God and I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my mistakes and fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow you and to serve you with all I've got because I declare today that I am a child of God I'm the righteousness of God. I'm the apple of God's eye. I am God's masterpiece, created to do good things. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Now, hey, I've asked the worship team to come out because I wanted to put something into practice. We're going to sing this song that says, I am. And some of you have been listening to lies. Right now, you're about to speak truth to those lies. And we're gonna declare who we are. Just give it a few more moments and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Come on. I am. 